Good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful privilege to be here, but it's especially a privilege to be called a child of God. And I'm so thankful this morning for Jesus. I'd like to pray before I begin here. Father, it's with fear and trembling that we come into your presence, and yet with just a wonderful love in my heart, Lord, knowing that you're a wonderful heavenly Father. Thank you for your love and your care for us. And one of the greatest desires of my heart this morning, Lord, is that you would open the windows of heaven, not at all because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. And I pray, Lord, along with the windows of heaven being open and the Holy Spirit being free to share, I pray that you would give us an attentive ear, Lord, and that there would be faith in our hearts along with the message, Lord. May there be faith in our hearts so that the word doesn't fall flat, but that there would be fruit. And we look to you for both, Lord. We look to you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and we look to you to add faith where we're weak, Lord. It's because of your kingdom that everything's okay. It's because we're your children that everything's okay. And I bless you for that. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for the calm and the peace that is found in heaven. Thank you for the everlasting arms of Jesus. Thank you for the church body. Lord, it's not a place where we sit, but it's a residence that you've taken up in our hearts that makes up a body of believers, Lord. And I thank you for that. And I pray that in every heart this morning, Lord, in all of the living rooms that are represented here in the local body and wherever, whoever is listening, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be free to come in and give courage and to anoint with courage, to anoint with the power of the Holy Spirit and to give direction and to just further your cause, Lord. Oh, that Jesus would be glorified this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We give you all honor and glory because it's only through Christ that we're here. Amen. Hallelujah. There's just a cry on my heart, and that is that in everything that we go through, that we become more like Jesus because of that. I'm going to read a wonderful promise in John 16 to open this morning. There's quite a, there's a few chapters here, starting in, in John 14, 15, 16, where Jesus is speaking. And in the end of 16, he says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, church, because I have overcome the world. And that's a tremendous promise to me this morning. Jesus was here. He he was willing to live as a man, take on flesh like we have And he said, in all of that, I've overcome this world. And that speaks two things to me. First of all, it it tells me that Jesus was so surrendered. You know, we read of his temptations when he was in the wilderness, when the devil came to him, and he was offered many things. He was offered fame. He was offered authority. And he turned all of that down to follow Jesus, or to, to follow the word that God had given him to follow And he says, I've overcome the world. But the second thing that this just gives me so much hope for um, is because of the life of Jesus, not only did he overcome the world in his own life, but he made it possible for us as his sons and daughters to do the same. And I want to read a verse in Colossians 2. Again, a wonderful promise of something that happened because of Jesus and his obedience and his willingness to go to the cross. Let's just start in verse 13. I'll read 13 through 15. He says, You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins, all our sins. And he canceled that record of charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. But look look at what he says in 15. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority, and he did that for us in our lives. It's a promise that we can have. But, you know, when Jesus said, I've overcome the world, my question or the question for me was, what is the world? And I'm going to go to 1 John 2 and just read what John said here. He says, do not love the world 
nor the things that it offers you. When you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. And I don't know where your mind goes when you think about the world, but this is what he said that the world offers us. Offers us. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And this is what Jesus overcame. And this is what he's telling us that we can overcome. And I thank God for that, that I don't have to live in failure and give in to the things that the world wants me to give in to. You know, we live in the world, but we do not have to be a part of it. And there's so many things that were offered by the world. But he brings it down into three sentences here, or three things. It's physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride. And we can be free from all of that through Jesus. I want to go to 1 John 2. Actually, that's where I'm at. Let's go to the next one. 2 Timothy 3. Also, a little bit of a picture of some of the things that we fight against. And in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 3, in the first verse, he says, You know this, Timothy. In the last days, and it's easy to think that we're there. You know, many generations have thought that. Many people have thought that. And I think that today, that we're in the last days. He says it will be very difficult. People will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, and be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. And the cry on my heart is that with all these pressures around us, that I become more and more like Jesus. How do we get there? How do we get there? You know, it talks of pride in here, and I've found no better way than to get rid of pride, than when I look at the mirror of the Word of God and I see how He wants me to live, or I look at the life of Jesus and I see how He lived. You know, we're tempted with pride. We're tempted with pride even when something is accomplished in our hearts by the power of the blood of Jesus, or when the Holy Spirit does something in us. Somehow, as humans, we want to take on a bit of pride and a bit we want to feel accomplished. We want to feel like we've like we've been somewhere, we've done something good. And may God take that out of us. And I tell you, church, that all flees when we look at Jesus, when we compare our hearts with Jesus rather than comparing with our brothers or with people around us. And I've, I've looked at this process of the world wanting to be a part of me, the world wanting to have its fingers and its, its, it wants to grab a hold of my life. And how do I get rid of it? In Galatians 2.20, he says, I no longer live. And this is just the cry from my heart, and I believe for many of you it's your cry. We don't want to live, but we want Christ to live in me. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How do I get there? And I believe it's death, church. He says, I am crucified with Christ that's why I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And my heart or my mind went to, and it's, we've heard the, the illustration a lot, to how gold is purified. And it's through fire. When gold is taken from the earth, you know, often, I think always, I don't know that much about mining gold, but it's, there's a lot of impurities that are dug up. If you take the raw product... And the Bible talks that one of the processes of refining gold is through fire. According to the internet, there are other ways as well, but I want to stick with the illustration of it being purified by fire. And it's extreme heat. It's not 
a little bit of uncomfortable fire, but it's extreme heat. Purification is not an easy process. It's not something that we can relax while it is being done. But if your true goal is to become like Jesus, I say embrace purification. And that's kind of where my heart is this morning. Because of trials, because of things that we go through, and, I, and there's, there's many, probably all of us, are in some way or another facing a trial. Some of you, it has no relation to what we're walking through as far as the pandemic or COVID-19. But there's a struggle going on in your life. There's a, there's a fire that's lit. And the Holy Spirit has lit that fire. Don't walk away from that. There is no other way for us to be made pure than to stay in that fire. Just as a potter puts clay through fire for it to become workable, God has chosen us to walk through difficult times to make us into what he wants us to be. We hate fire. We love to be comfortable. I'm speaking from my own self, from my heart. I don't like to be in extreme difficulty. But just like in gold, the raw product, there's a lot of filth in it. And the only way to burn that out is with extreme heat. We all want to get from the raw product to gold that you have in a ring or you have somewhere and you see it glisten and you, and you see the beauty of it. We want to get there in our spiritual life, realizing that there is sin within us, realizing that there's stain, that there's trash in us yet. We want to get from point A to point B somehow miraculously. And it's not like that with gold, and neither will it be like that with us. If you're going through a fiery trial, one part of me wants to say, thank God for it. It means that he has an interest in you. It tells me that he's got his sights on you. He's, he's got an interest in the gold that is in you. He sees that you have some in, imperfections or that you have some impurities. And he's, he's wanting to get at it, and he's going to put you through the fire to do it. And so in, 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 on one side, I want to say thank God for that. But on the other side, I want to say take courage. It's not easy. You know, Paul said that he blesses God for those things, and I, I, I see a bit why he says that. It's because he saw the outcome of it. And God hates any of myself that is still in me. You know, we, can, we are born with strengths and weaknesses. And any of our strength does us no good in the kingdom of God. My own strength is a hindrance. And not only that, the more I look at what God tries to do in my life, I see that my strength is disgusting to God. He can't use it in any way. It doesn't help him. It doesn't benefit. It's not something that can come alongside the, the, the Holy Spirit of God and that can help him. My talents, my, my strength don't help him. I need to die to everything that is from me. And it takes a fire to do that. And I really question if we've never seen filth if we've ever truly repented. You know, we can't be grandfathered into the kingdom of God. The church would like to offer a Christianity without fire. But I don't believe in that kind of Christianity. I, don't, I think it's fake. I believe that it's a imitation from the devil. There is no pure gold without purification, and there is no pure heart without going through a fire. Let's go back to 2 Timothy and just read the next verse. This is why I see that it's so dangerous to walk away from the cross or to walk away from the fire that God wants to bring into our lives. In verse 5, after that whole list that I read of things that will be at the last day, he says they will also act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And that tells me that these people are in the church because I think the King James says they have a form of godliness. Godliness. 
If you think of heaven and who all was there in the beginning, we know that Lucifer was there. But because of his pride, he was cast out. He chose his own selfish way. He was a part of heaven. And yet he became so evil because of him wanting what he wanted. And you look at Judas, one of the chosen 12. Jesus picked him. Jesus had him. He was one of his, he was one that Jesus wanted to walk with him while he was on earth. And at one point in John 6, in verse 70, Jesus said, I've chosen 12, but even one of you is a devil. And that just tells me that there's people in the church that have a form. They act religious. They were perhaps even born again at one time. They have been baptized. They take communion. But they've rejected the cross. And so they end up having this form. How could Judas walk with Jesus for a number of years? And it ended up that he had the devil in him. Somewhere, people push away from the fire. And I tell you, church, we have that choice. We don't have to stay in the trials. We don't have to stay in the fire. I thought of that parable of the tares and the wheat that Jesus gave. He said that in the, the kingdom of, of God is like a man that went out and he sowed wheat in his field and then when he slept or when the workers slept that night, someone else came and sowed tares. And, you know, we've, I've heard that tares being used as weeds. Or some people say it's, a, it's another grain. And I would tend to believe this is true. Um, the one commentary that I was looking at would, would tend to believe that this grain was darnel which is, I'm not familiar with the grain, but I was looking it up. It's a, it's a grain, and when it's young, before it's mature, it looks exactly like wheat. When it's, when it's, it's just a grass that grows. It's a green stem that comes up. And you cannot tell until it reaches maturity what is the good wheat and what is the darnel. But there's a, when it's mature, one of its, one way you can tell the tares or the darnel, is it's an, it has an erect and a rigid stem. And it has grain on its head, but it doesn't bow like the wheat does. Probably all of us have seen wheat when there's a lot of grain heads on the end of it, then it bows. Darnel doesn't do that. It stays erect, even in maturity. And they say that darnel is actually poisonous. If you take it in small amounts, you can get a high out of it. It's, they put it in beer and uh, different things that you can get a high out of it if you put it in small doses. And it's such a good example of in the church, you can tell by the humility or the lack of it in people there may be fruit there, and it's hard to tell. You know, I imagine many of the disciples didn't realize the state that Judas was in. They didn't recognize it. They didn't realize there was a man walking with them every day. He was, he was their brother. He was a part of their church, and there was evil in him. But that matured one day. And then we could see. And that's what Jesus was saying with this story. You know, they asked, well, should we go through and try to get rid of all the tares? And Jesus said, no, you can't tell. You're going to destroy the whole thing if you get rid of that. But when it comes to maturity, you can see who is who. You can see the, you can tell the difference between the tares and the wheat. And if we never learn to give in to the work and the fire that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to our lives, we're going to end up being a tear, sitting in church, having a form, taking a part in communion. 
but being defiled. And we can say no, like I said earlier, we can say no to the daily life of the cross. We can say no to the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. But if we do, we're going to end up as a tear. I think so often it's midway through our Christian life when we make a decision and people don't always recognize when that happens. We make a decision that, we, yes, we will embrace the cross 100% or we're going to choose our own way and step out of the fire. It, God allows us to do that. May we never do that and walk around the will of God. You know, one thing that this time that we're going through now does, it either allows us to focus more and more on Jesus, or we're like Peter in the storm, where we see the storm, and then we fall. There's a there's just been a, a burden on my heart. It's something that God's been shining onto my life. Some of this is a personal, personal testimony just in the last weeks. I've seen how, and I'm going to call it addicted, I am to an easy life. I have what I think are my rights to pleasure and to having plenty and to entertainment and to coming and going as I like, and just doing what I feel like doing. And then we become discontent or grumpy when a democratic governor takes that away from us. Let's go to First Peter and just read a little bit of instruction that Peter gave to us. And I think it's for this time, First Peter 2, in verse 11, he says, Your dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. And then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I was talking with my wife just about things, my daily life at work there. There's... Um, there's the grumbling that goes on. There's the discontentment that goes on. And I told her it's sometimes hard for me to know where to walk on that. No, I don't believe that everything is done properly and right or like I think it should be done. But what happens to my testimony as a Christian if I start complaining because of circumstances that God has allowed me to be in? He says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. In verse 13, he says, For the Lord's sake, respect all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials that he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. You're free, and yet you're God's slaves, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone, and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. And here he talks to slaves, but I love what he says. I think there's wonderful instruction for us here. He says, you, are, you who are slaves must accept the authority of your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased with you when you do what is right and patiently endure unfair treatment. And then he says, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong, but only if it's for right. And I thought of Jesus when he was before Pilate. If there was, you know, we, we look at the circumstances we're in and we're tempted to think that it's unjust, that it's just not fair. That is, there's really no reason for it. There, we shouldn't have to do this. And I thought of Jesus when he was before Pilate. If there was ever anything that was unfair treatment, it was Jesus being tried as a criminal and having to go to the cross. But he didn't defend himself. 
I should probably go there. I'm going to mess up the wording of it. I think it's in John. It might be in Matthew. Just give me a minute here. I didn't write it down. But I love the confident response that Jesus gave. You know, he, he was all God and he was all man. And he had the ability to get out of that situation if he would have wanted to. Or if he would have thought that it was God's will that he does. Okay, it might be in John. Yes. Jesus, when it was before Pilate, Pilate was asking him questions, some that he would answer, some that he would have, but he never defended himself. And at the end of it, Pilate says, you know, Jesus, I have the power to release you or to crucify you. And Jesus could have at that moment asked for the powers of heaven and the angels to get him out of that situation, but he realized that as son of man, he was there for a purpose. God had a plan. And he said, you, you know, he looked at Pilate and he said, you have no power over me at all unless it is given to you from above. And so the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. But his response of not fear, not being intimidated, but realizing that his situation that he was in, although it was absolutely wrong, was okay because God put him there and he was content. And there's things that we walk through, not just in this situation, that are unfair and that are not just and that are not right. But I don't read anywhere in the Bible that we are to talk evil of the authorities over us. But he says to pray for them and to honor them. And I've had to repent. Because I want to get disgruntled at the circumstances. And if you really look at it, I'm going to be ashamed one day in heaven when I'm next to people that have given up everything for Christ. And I was unhappy because I couldn't go out to eat. Or I thought some freedoms that I'm allowed to have as a citizen of the United States were taken away. Let's not go there, church. But we have a testimony that we need to live in front of the unbelievers. There's a there's a book that I'm reading, uh, Charles, or C.T. Studd, probably some of you have heard his name, know of him. He was a young man that was born into a very wealthy family. His dad was really wealthy. And his dad got converted, and there was four boys, and his dad was such an evangelist after he got converted that his boys would hide in their rooms and they would pretend to be asleep when their dad would come around because they knew that he would approach them about their salvation. And eventually all four of them got converted. But this CT stud, he ended up being a missionary. He went to China. His dad died soon after. CT was, stud, was, his, he was young yet. But when he was in China, he found out that his dad died and that there was a lot of money left to him. This was in 1887. And he was just getting ready to get married. He was engaged. They were going to get married in China. And his dad left him 29,000 euros in 1887. And I was looking that up. Today, that's worth $850,000. And up to this time, he hadn't lived off of any money from his parents. He had felt like he needs to trust God for everything. And so he didn't live off his rich dad. But when this money came, it was on his heart that he needs to give it all away. And I would think, as a logical 
Christian, that this was God's way of providing for me when I'm in China. But between him and the Lord, he was convinced that God wanted him to give it away, but he knew there was a verse that said that if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. And so he gave everything of the 29,000 euros away except for a little over 3,000 euros, and he gave that to his wife-to-be so that he could obey the scripture that said he needs to take care of his family. And his wife, his girlfriend, or his bride-to-be just looked at him and said, Charlie, I'm not, you're not going to outdo me. She said, we're going to give everything. And so she gave, after it was in her lap, she gave the rest of that money away. And he had a hard life in China, a very hard life. When you talk about physical situation that he was in, like I said earlier, we love the things that make life easy for us. We get attached to them. We think we have rights to them. This man gave everything up. He didn't have, even, he didn't have a bed to sleep in. Some of the food he ate was, in my opinion, not very good. And he would write little letters home, and he would just give hints of a little bit of hardships that he went through. And he would be so happy for the little mat that he slept on. He would be so happy for some of the food that he ate. His focus was on Jesus Christ and not on the things around him. And I tell you, the church in the U.S., we've got our focus on the wrong thing. We think we deserve the comforts. But like I said earlier, I'm going to be ashamed in heaven someday when I see that I grumble about the small things that God asks me to give up. And I tell you, church, we have no rights. Maybe as U.S. citizens, according to the law, we do. Jesus gave all that up. And I think we need to. And this may be just what we're going through now, maybe just a little bit of a shaking to let us see where our hearts really are. We think we deserve, if we work hard, to be able to buy our own houses and to live in comfort. We think we deserve to be able to live freely in this country because that's what the law states. We think that we deserve to be able to come together and not hide in underground places to get together. We think we deserve the things that our life has offered us up until now. And then when I read a book like this C.T. Stud, then I realize I don't. I don't. And I... Woe is me. I've had to repent. These things aren't wrong. But as he says in 2 Timothy, it's when you love pleasure more than you love God. And my heart was there. That's where it's sin. And you know, we can look at a man like C.T. Studd and we can think that I'm going to follow his example. I'm going to go empty my bank account. But we also read in the scripture that even if you give your body to be burned, if you don't do it because you love Christ, then it's worthless. And so I'm not saying that you take radical that you make radical decisions, what I'm saying is hold everything you have with an open palm. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit clean out of you everything that needs to be cleaned out. We're full of trash. We're full of rubbish in our own. And many of us are seeking to become more like Jesus but don't walk away from the fire then. In fact, be encouraged if you're in a trial. Be encouraged because that shows that Jesus has got his eyes on you. He's wanting to purify you. He's chosen you to put in the fire next. He's chosen your chunk of gold to put in that heat next. He wants to see the pure gold in you. He sees there's trash in me. He sees there's still debris that needs to be burned off. 
but he's chosen us to walk through the fire. Don't walk away from it. It's easy to do that, but then we walk away from God and we end up being like was described in Timothy where we have a form of godliness, but there's no power to go with it. Church, the power of God gives us power to overcome sin. It gives us power to live in peace in hard times. That's the power that we need. We need that Holy Spirit, but we don't get from point A to point B without being tested. And so I say, if you're going through a hard time, whether it's related to our economy or COVID-19, or if it's related to something you've been walking through from even before this, I say, take courage because God has got his eyes on you and he wants to accomplish something in you. And so we must have patience. We must have patience. It's our, it's our laziness. You know, one thing that I also, I'm just opening myself up here, something that I've seen in myself in the last couple of weeks. I, I long, church, I long to be able to have the rivers of living water coming from me all the time. That's, a, that's just a goal that I have. But I've seen, I have extra time right now. I'm not going away. I work every day. I have that privilege. Because of where we're working, we have the okay to work. But I do have a lot of extra time, some. And I've observed, and I probably more of you can identify with this, you know, if I sit on the couch and spend two and a half hours on social media trying to figure out the world's problems and who did what and what is wrong, you know the feeling you come away with, don't you? I do. It's empty. And I know how that compares to even five minutes of being on my face before God seeking heaven. And I know the results of that. And so I say, don't choose unwisely right now. Don't spend your time unwisely. Don't be lazy. If you have more time, don't just waste it on things that really don't matter. I think media is an enemy, can be an enemy to our time. And I just want to encourage you to, to do what you do, do it wisely. There's a couple more scriptures I want to read here at the end. Wonderful, wonderful scriptures in 1 Peter 1. And to all of you, I don't want to speak with any condemnation today. If you feel it's on your heart, to do certain things. I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just telling you what was on my heart, things that I've been convicted of by reading Scripture. And let's remember to always operate our lives from what Scripture says. But if you have a freedom to do something that I don't, there is absolutely no condemnation. Zero. Because I know what it's like to be the one that's wrong. I've been... There's... Many times, I often tell my wife she's always right. So many times when we have a little bit of a disagreement or we don't see something the same, if you let it come to an end somewhere, I was off. And I've even spoken strongly about certain things and then I've seen later that, whoa, I was off a little bit. And so there's zero condemnation but if there's instruction from the word of God, I want to follow it. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. An encouraging scripture. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance and an inheritance that is kept in heaven. And this is what we're after, church. It's kept in heaven for you, pure, undefiled, beyond the reach of change and, and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed at the last day for all to see. And so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials will only show that your faith is genuine. 
It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. That is the message that I want you to hear. Even though we endure a few small trials, God is not trying to take us down. He's trying to purify us. And let's not run away from purification because it hurts or because it feels like something that we don't want to endure. Let's, don't, let's not get so caught up in wanting to have everything pleasurable that we miss when God is trying to work something in us. I'm just going to read two more verses, then I'll turn, turn the time over to Dan to close the service. But let's go to Jude 24. Wonderful. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling, and he will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence. And that's why he's taking us through trials, because he wants to present us to Jesus with great joy. And he says, I'll present you without a single fault. All glory to God, all glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Thank God that he's in control and that the trials that he has chosen for us to go through are not meant to take us down or to discourage us or to destroy us, but to allow us to have our faith tested so that we know it's strong and that he can present us to Jesus one day as pure, but not as the raw product of gold taken out that still has a lot of filth to it. He wants to present us over here as gold that's tried, as gold that is purified, that has had that crud taken off by fire. Yield to it and humble yourself. You know, I can't imagine Jesus often when I don't know how Jesus would respond. I try to picture what Jesus would do in the situation. And I can't imagine Jesus fighting for his rights as a U.S. citizen, but his goal would be to encourage the church. Let's follow his example and not get sidetracked in looking at the storm. Let's look at Jesus, and then we don't have to fall. But again, I say, I, I really want you to get this. If, if you're going through a trial, be encouraged, not because it feels good, but because you can know that God has his eyes on you in that time. He sees something in you that is precious to him. It might be a little bit defiled with some of yourself. It might be a little bit defiled with some of the trash that we bring along naturally. All he's trying to do is burn that off so that he can have a pure bride for Jesus at the end of the day. And I tell you, church, our physical lives may not get easier as we come towards the end of time. Bless God that we've had the U.S. to live in but it's not a right that we have. Our only rights are be our heavenly rights. Our rights are to have hope through hard times. Our rights are to have joy, are to have peace. Isn't it crazy that we can go to bed and sleep at night with peace in our hearts when the world is in turmoil and upside down? But that's a right that we have in Christ. And I thank God for those rights. Let's lay down some of the things that we think we should have to gain what Christ says we can have. Amen. Lord bless you.